make sure my microphone's on for the recording device. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who, as you can see, went to the cross for us. That is, He shed His blood for us, washed us clean in that same blood by those holy waters of our baptism to declare us a kingdom of priests, to serve God and His Father to Him, be all glory, honor, and dominion. This is most certainly true. So let it be among us. That is for you and for me who confess His name, that which we so wonderfully studied in Bible study this morning at 9 a.m. to throw a little, little advertisement there, the divine name, saying it confidently, praising it, adoring it, thanking Him. For a name isn't just an object. It describes who He is for us. We call upon Him to save us, to strengthen us, to in short help us, to be who we were meant to be for our neighbor, for ourselves even, in Christ. And it comes full circle, that which I like to call actually the circle of grace, because we can't help but come back to Him again and again, and His Word, as He strengthens us, shows us that we need to come back for more strength. That for which, if we were not already in that circle, how do we get to it? That's a profound question. I I really don't know. So I thank God again that I am in it, that my parents brought me to it, And ever since, that circle has been ongoing in my life. Praise God. The sermon theme for today is happily ever after. Again, linking to that wedding theme or that marriage theme. A concept that talks about, really, I think, that presupposition we usually have as maybe single people before entering that estate, like it's somehow the goal. Once we're there, everything's going to be hunky-dory, right, from there on, as Disney has been showing us for years. I've got the prince, so now I'm just going to live in a big castle and everyone's going to do what I say. And then that, that's one thing I, I have appreciated as a father, particularly as a parent, to see those sequels where they're like, oh, now, now the prince and the princesses uh, have children and now they, you know, they, they, they have the reality that, that hits home. Um, not that I, I necessarily approve of exactly where Disney goes. Uh, I like the, the concept of the, the reality, the more, you know, what is real hits home uh, and that we do, we do have to work at our marriages. Uh, I I will say this much of my uh, pre-marriage counseling courses. uh, When they they come to me, it's a good indication. And uh, males and females do have a very real different perspective when when coming into a situation by by nature. Uh, One tends to look forward uh, and, is, and is thinking of, of their, their perfect prince, shall we say, and, and I can, you know, we can get married and I can always mold him into the, the man I want him to be. Um, and then there's the male perspective, of course. My wife is absolutely perfect and I don't want her to change uh, at all. And then, uh, you know, life happens and, and uh, they change. Now, both are wrong. Not that we shouldn't or don't change but that we change together. So there isn't, you know, I'm over here and I have a view of what should be and I'm going to make that happen. Or I don't want things ever to change. That, that's probably more unrealistic. Yes, the, the men do have a, a more unrealistic view. But that we're always changing anyway, whether we're married or not. But when we're married... We're always changing, growing together. A man becomes a father. 
as well as a husband. A wife becomes a mother as well as the woman that the man married. And this is a natural evolvement, shall we say, within the process of a man and woman loving one another and sacrificing for one another, but actually realizing the many blessings which God is giving us in that process, which even with my seventh child just, just blew me away when I saw them for the very first time. You think maybe after you know, five or six, you'd seen it all, but nope. No, they, they come out and you're like, you just, you can't stop but weep for, for like a couple minutes. Uh, let's, let's not get into that. But, um, but we're constantly changing. And actually, I think we can apply that to this concept as Christ himself says he is the bridegroom of the church, his bride. And we do well to put Christ on a pedestal and say, never change. But the beautiful thing is he joins with us. And as imperfect as we are, by joining with us, he humbles himself, becomes one of us. And we'd be wrong to think that that makes him imperfect but that we are then able to grow together as he sanctifies us by promising that he'll never leave us, right? This is his wedding vow to us, that he would even sacrifice himself for us as he did on the cross. And then even in his resurrection, then we are growing as he raises us every day, as he drowns our old self, and our sinful self, to live for him again, as anyone would, that perfect husband who has sacrificed himself for his bride, the church, you and me. And of course, that's the goal for every man, which we will never attain to, but we have a pretty good example. And we pray to God and we continue to repent, that is, come back to him, to ask to be better than we are. And if we need a description, St. Paul gives us one, right, in our epistle for, to, for the day. How can we be better? To understand that love should be genuine, that we are to hate what is evil. That's something to wrap our heads around as well. In uh, a, a, a PC world, shall we say, that, that won't have anything to do with the, even the word hate, like just can't exist. But understand that, that to hate evil is actually a good thing. And to be aware that it exists. To hold fast then to what is good. And sometimes that does the job. So just by holding on to the good, we're not in the evil. Right? By loving your wife, you're not currently in an adulterous affair, right? To put it simply. Love one another with brotherly affection, speaking to the church as a whole, right? Honoring those husbands who belong to other wives as your brother, not as an object for your affection, but someone whom you can love much deeper by showing them honor and respecting their marriage vows. What a concept. Do not be slothful, but be zealous, be fervent in spirit. It goes along with serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, being patient in tribulation. You know what that is today. Being constant in prayer. Right? Bring God into your situation of trial, of suffering, of pain, of hurt, of disillusionment, of realizing, oh, now I am a parent. It's not going to be like it was going out every night, out in the town, with my spouse having some fun. I, sometimes, especially with your first child, you, I mean, your, your life is just upside down. With, with the simplest mundane task, 
I think, I think it hit me very briefly postnatal depression when I was like, I've, I've got to bathe this thing. It's just this, the most random mundane thing. Uh, I soon got over it, and uh, you know, with, with each child as well. And then being able to see the love with which my children love my other children. I mean, that, that was just another thing I could never have even predicted when I was like, Lord, give me a spouse. Give me a, a wife that loves me, right? It's the, the things you learn along the way. The way you grow. Again, the way you change. And we change together and naturally and in a way that, that I wouldn't want it any other way. I was just going to say, uh, actually, as the, the, the first reading was being read, I couldn't help again but, but uh, remember our study on the second commandment, not taking the Lord's name in vain, the opposite of which is just praising the Lord again and again, realizing with such phrases as declares the Lord and thus says the Lord your God, which wouldn't necessarily need to be said. And if God has revealed this, one could simply utter the words of wisdom, which would be good for us, but that the Lord really said these things. And that by knowing that, we get a double portion of strength. By knowing that the Lord accomplishes what he sets out to do. Of course, this isn't more prominent than when we have the full revelation of the gospel and when he sets out to save his children, save his bride. He accomplishes his purposes. As bizarre as that might sound to describe his church as both his children and his bride, nowhere near as strange as the relationship with which God has with himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we put it that way, we are the children of God who is our heavenly Father. We are the bride of Christ who is the Son of the Father, who intimately connects himself to us in a heavenly, spiritual, divine way, not to be perverted or abused in our own imagination's eye, but in a way that we can understand he loves us far greater than we could possibly understand. And in a way that he would join himself to us mysteriously describing us as his body, which actually gives us a bond as well, greater than we could imagine, past these pews even, perhaps with other family members who would reject the name of Jesus, our bond as one body in Christ is greater and yes, it is a great goal of ours to go out to those family members who don't believe and unite them with us in this truth for their eternal well-being. But it just stands as the truth that this word also divides families, mothers against daughters, mother-in-laws against daughter-in-laws, that kind of thing. But it's for our good. It's because he loves us. It's because he wants to unite with us. It's why he would illustrate with such stories or narratives as our gospel lesson. Why mention the fact that Jesus went to a wedding? Because he wants to foreshadow for us the wonderful relationship we have and the rejoicing we can have too. I love that the, the series The Chosen does have a, uh, an emphasis and focus on this particular narrative. And we see Jesus really enjoying his time with his disciples. And even a way that, that he, I think he, he, he plays with Andrew a little bit. He has two left feet, so he can't do the wedding dance properly. But they just have a laugh and they have their arms around each other and they're, they're frolicking around in circles and that kind of thing. Uh, but of course, the, then there's, there's moments of silence and pause. And then 
the film slows down and you see Jesus make eye contact with Mary. And the, the ask, it is a request that he do what he came to do. And he says, it's, it's, not, it's not my time yet, remember? It's not my time yet. And there's maybe a flashback to when they're in the temple and Jesus is 12 years old. And she says to him, it's not your time yet. I don't want to let you go. I'm your mother. Don't ever do that to me again. Isn't it my time yet? This is how much he loves us and wants to be united with us. And then when that hour comes, as he so describes it, we cannot help but feel, yes, even the ecstasy and the zeal. Paul describes it for us in our gospel lesson. And the passion and the emotion that comes with this love, which we never want to be divorced from. So that even when we are faithless, He is faithful. What a joy it is to be with the Lord in any and every context. So that even before He dies and rises, the Pharisees are questioning the disciples and say, Why? Why don't your disciples fast? Why don't they follow the rituals and ceremonies we've set out for them according to the traditions of our fathers, the Pharisaical code? Why should the bride fast when they are with the bridegroom and their joy is complete? So it felt to be with the Lord. So we will feel one day as he opens that door to that great wedding feast to us one day, because we're ready, even when we trim our lamps, that initial trimming, our lamps are full with oil, because he has given us his spirit, and the cleansing of our souls in these holy waters, and makes us complete in him. May he always fill that wedding chalice of joy and real, as we're kind of continuing that Christmas epiphany theme, that, that Christmas spirit. You can kind of picture that, that ghost of Christmas present who appears to Scrooge and says, come and know me better, man. And he gives him this special chalice. Who knows what's in it? It's just, just the spirit of presence and joy and peace and comfort. We have that in Christ's chalice for us, which brings us forgiveness and peace in Him. This is His wedding feast. Come and taste and see for you and for me in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen. And may the peace which surpasses our understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.